think we're on. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. It's so bright in these lights, I can't really see you, so I can say with clear conscience, you're all looking really good in the, every last one of you. Now, as my eyes get used to the lights, I can see that there are a few exceptions here and there, but not many. <laughs> It's so good to be here. We've moved into a new season. We're in a new era. You don't have to be really all that prophetic in this hour to know the times they are changing. And then we're going to have to work at listening. Because the only way we can navigate through this season is with Holy Spirit leading us. Amen. So I love this place. I love this house. Ronnie sent me the uh, recording of the ministry that took place over him. And I was thinking, boy, four or five years ago. And he said, that was 10 years ago. Then I didn't feel quite so bad at how much I had aged from the video, but but uh, it's good to rehearse those things isn't it? And, and see what God has done. And it was great for me to listen and hear what the Lord said way back then and now see the fruit of that happening. Such an awesome thing. And thank you for being here. Appreciate what Dwayne had to say. Appreciate my friends Clay and Susan and Greg and Joanne and, and the granddaddy of the place, Ron Phillips. What a great man. I feel we are moving into a season unlike any that any of us have ever experienced. I believe what God has been doing for the past, not three or four or five years, 30 or 40 years, has been to prepare us to equip, position, uh, coordinate, orchestrate things in the church for what we are about to step into now. I believe we are moving into our finest hour. I do. I believe we're moving into the greatest outpouring of Holy Spirit in history. I believe we'll see more souls saved in the next couple of decades than we've seen in the last 2,000 years. I do. I believe we're going to see entire nations come to Christ. I believe God's going to save America. I believe he's going to restore us to our roots, our righteous roots and that we will accomplish what he wants and needs for us to accomplish. When the Lord came to me in 2000 and visited me with really what I've come to understand was a mantle that he was placing on me. And though uh, it really had been probably, well, in some ways I sort of say a 10 year process, it was really probably about a 50 year process, but because he, the way he works with us from birth, but, but when he came to me that night, at one point he spoke to me very, very clearly, as clearly as I've ever heard him. And he said, I must have America for what I'm about to do in the earth. I must have America. 
and you're going to help me get her. And God has an army now. He has a prayer army. He has a, a remnant of believers that understand his ways enough to cooperate with him. He has a, a remnant that understands what it means to be the ecclesia. He has a remnant that understands what it means to be a part of a company that represents all five gifts of Christ to the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And he says in that passage in Ephesians 4, when that happens or through those things, I'm paraphrasing saying when it happens, because he says through those giftings, we can reveal to the earth the fullness of Christ. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you only have a uh, if you only have two of his five anointings operating in the church, you can only re you can only represent or reveal forty percent of it. For so long, we had were pastors and teachers, ev evangelist pastors, and God had the teachers in the seventies, and we had three of the five gifts operating in the church, and. 60% of who Jesus is was flowing through us. But then in the 80s and 90s, he restored the prophet. And then we had four of the five and a greater dimension of Christ's person, his anointing began to be released in the earth. And then in the 90s and 2000s, he, he restored understanding of the apostolic anointing. And now we have the fullness of the Christ anointings. We're not walking in them at the highest level. We will mature in them and move in them at even higher levels. But we are moving in all of them. And we can now, according to that passage, reveal the fullness of Christ in the earth. Let me say it this way. For the first time in centuries, maybe since the early church, the body of Christ has the potential of fully revealing who Jesus is to the earth. And we will move in the fullness. So I'm just warming up here. This is not my message. I'll get to that in a minute. But they got me up so early, I feel like I can take an extra 30 minutes up here. So. But we're not only moving in the fullness of his anointings, giftings, we will now mature and move into higher levels of each anointing. Prophets are not yet operating at the full potential of Christ's prophetic anointing. Apostles are not. Teachers are not. What's the fullness of Christ's teaching anointing look like? I'm not really sure. I know I've never seen it, but I can tell you this. When he taught, people sat for days at a time without eating, including children listening to him. I'm not sure what the fullness of his evangelistic, prophetic, apostolic healing anointing looks like. But I can tell you this, the Bible says that myriads of people came to hear him and they were all healed. All of them. So we're going to see the fullness of the Christ anointing manifested in the earth in this hour. And I think from, from this moment on, we, we just go higher and higher. And we follow him more and more. And God has good things in store for us. How many of you follow us on Give Him 15? Let me see your hands. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm just asking because... I want to know who the more spiritual people are in the room. <laughs> I 
the rest of you don't don't be terribly embarrassed Join us if you can, Monday through Friday. You can go to GiveHim15.com or to the Give Him 15 app or go to YouTube and we do a short devotional and lead in prayer for the nation. And God's really using that. In fact, I, I was shocked um, a few days ago when my staff came to me, and I mean I was shocked and said in 2021, you had 35 million views of Giving 15. Incredible. I had nothing to do with it, by the way. They pushed me into it, and the lady prophesied me into it, and I argued with God all the way. How do you take credit for that? So I'm going to read a dream to you. I'm not going to read yet the dream. I will get to the dream in a few minutes that um, talks about the lion and the sheep. For those of you that do follow us, uh, you've heard the dream that I believe became sort of the theme for this gathering and um, very significant dream. Uh, so I'm gonna share a dream that led up to that one, talk about some insights from it, because one of the things I've been uh, seeing happen now is some of the prophets that I'm running with, God is starting to give them a, a, a dreams in series. They're having series of dreams. They'll have a dream a week or later, a day later, a month later, a year later. God will give them another dream related to the first dream. He'll hide things in the dream sometimes. And then six months later, he'll give them another dream and show them what, what it was that they couldn't figure out. Some are having on their third and fourth dream connected to uh, the first one that God gave them. Some of these dreams that the Lord is giving now, I'm finding myself having to spend many days, an hour or two here and there, just pressing into the Lord saying, what are you saying to us through this? Incredible insights are coming. Obviously, we don't put them up to a standard of Scripture. They have to line up with Scripture and be consistent with the principles of Scripture. But the prophets are going to another level. And in just a few minutes when I finish this message, I'm going to bring a couple of them up here, and we're just going to begin to pray and ask the Lord to give us a prophetic flow of, of a prayer and declaration over the nation. And we'll just all jump into that together, amen? And we'll lose some things over America. But this first dream was given well, actually a year ago. And I'm reading it because the dream about the sheep and the lion flowed out of this dream. So the dream says, Dutch, Tim, my brother, Clay Nash, Ken Malone, another man I run with, and this brother who had the dream and his wife. We're sitting at a high top cedar table on a deck by a lake, and there were six empty seats left at the table. There was a large map of Washington, D.C. rolled out over a map of the United States. We were discussing the process of the prayer journey we and the team had been on over the last two and a half months. Dutch said, I know we've been obedient to do what we've been commanded by the Lord. And I know we've been successful. 
I then noticed and pointed out to Dutch that the map on top, the map of Washington, D.C., was torn down the middle. And everybody said, amen. You didn't, you didn't say it, but I know in your heart you did. It was torn down the middle. It was jagged, like an old map would look after being torn, though this was not noticeable unless you look closely. Dutch said we should fuse the map back together. By the way, you can't do that. This is a, it's a, it's a, it's a picture here of that and the next statement of, of, of us as humans trying to figure out how can we fix this mess. Let's, we should fuse this map back together. How do we do that? I, the man Greg, having a dream, said to Dutch, we'll weld it. How many know you can't weld paper? We'll weld it together. It'll be stronger than before. Clay Nash is a great welder. It'll, come, it'll never come apart where he welds it together. Well, you can't do that. Suddenly, we realized someone was approaching us from behind. We turned to look behind us and saw people coming into the room from the great cloud of witnesses in the dream. William Penn founder of Pennsylvania, Billy Graham, F.F. F. Bosworth, Graham, of course, evangelism, Bosworth, signs and wonders, healing, miracles, George Washington, dressed in his continental uniform, not his president suit, but his military uniform, Abraham Lincoln, and Jesus. Wouldn't, wouldn't have made much difference if he hadn't shown up. They came up on the deck and each of them took a seat at the table. Jesus then spoke very calmly and said, George, he called everybody by their first name. When Jesus spoke his name, George Washington began speaking to us. And he said, good job, Dutch. The ecclesia has completed phase one. Operation Expose All went well. And we've achieved our goal. Again, Jesus spoke very calmly and said, Billy, pointing at Billy Graham. When Jesus called his name, Billy Graham began speaking to us. Guys, now it's time for phase two. We're here to activate Operation Redeem All. Billy went on to say, Ready yourselves and ready the ecclesia. Days of great victory are just ahead of you. How many of you believe that? Really? Do you really believe that? I've never been more confident in my life that we're moving into the greatest season of revival and harvest that the planet has ever experienced. Never been more confident. Ready yourselves and ready the ecclesia. Days of great victory are just ahead of you. These great days of victory will be met with much resistance from darkness. As you release light, however, America will transform and be reestablished right before your very eyes. 
The conversation continued as Jesus said, Dutch, I have something for you. Now some of these, a lot of these dreams that prophets have been having about me for the last couple of years, I mean, I realize that some of it is for me personally, but much of the time, I simply represent what I have represented literally over the last 30 years, and that's the praying church. God used me in the prayer movement, and I've been a part of the prayer movement around the world for the last 30 years. Written numerous books, and now, now I'm associated also with the apostolic prophetic movement and the, and the group that I feel like understands what it means to truly be the ecclesia, the legislating, governing body of Christ in the earth. So a lot of times when I'm doing something, something or given something in these dreams, it's not just me, it's us. Does that make sense? And that's true with a lot of dreams, of course, people often symbolize other things and other movements. So Jesus said, Dutch, I have something for you. Jesus lifting his hands from his lap where he had previously had them resting, presented Dutch with a ring. It was gold, a gold like no other I've ever, I had ever seen. The gold was so pure it was as if you could see through it. Sounds like the streets of heaven, doesn't it? The ring had a key reverse etched in it along with the words King of Kings and Kinsman Redeemer. And I'm not going to go into all these meanings and, and, and what some of these things symbolize. But the key, the, the ring shows up again in the next dream. That's why I'm reading that part. Jesus said, Dutch, wear this ring. And all that you put this ring upon will be impacted with the weight of the kingdom. King of kings. It's a signet ring representing the authority of the Lord. King of kings. Kinsman redeemer. Jesus then passed a gavel to me. governmental authority, legislative authority, judicial authority, binding and loosing authority. The words bind and loose when Jesus said, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom and you'll bind and loose and what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Those are judicial terms. They came to be physical terms that literally pictured binding or tying something up and untying something or loosing something, but they originated as courtroom judicial terms, that which is legally binding. Or to undo a contract or dissolve a contract or something that is legally binding. So what Jesus was really saying in Matthew 16 was, I'm giving you my authority my governmental authority as my ecclesia, I'm giving that to you, and you have the right to step in and influence my governmental, uh, release my governmental will on the earth. And when you say, this is no longer allowed, I'll back it up from heaven. And when you say, this hold is dissolved, I'll back it up from heaven. So he gave me a gavel, picturing his judicial authority. It was an old wooden gavel that had Revelation 19, 11 and 12 inscribed on it, which say, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written no one knew except himself. And that was written and inscribed on the gavel. When Dutch took the old gavel in his hand, it became very heavy. The weight of it 
seemed impossible to handle. When I grabbed it, it just fell to the table. I said, this gavel's too heavy. I can't lift it. How will we ever use it? <laughs> Jesus said, Dutch, my boy. I love it when he calls me his boy. He said in the dream, Dutch, my boy, you have to talk to it. It knows our dialect. And when Dutch began to speak in heaven's language, the gavel became light and easy to handle. Is that awesome or what? You can't handle the power of God and the authority of God with human strength. You must tap into the supernatural ability of heaven in order to handle the authority of God in the earth. And that's where we're going, amen? amen. Jesus said to the table now, have we reached a place of agreement? Are we all in agreement with the release of Operation Redeem All? Did you know for Jesus to do what he wants to do on the earth, we have to agree with him? It's not that he needs our permission, but he needs our cooperation. For him to do in your life what he wants to do, you have to agree with him. He said to us in the dream, are we in agreement? He then become, began calling the name of each one from the cloud of witnesses sitting around the table and each one gave their yes to the assignment. He then looked at those of us still alive. What about you six? What is your answer? Your vote is needed to complete this council's assignment. We all answered a resounding yes. Dutch them without thinking, slammed the old gavel on the table and said, the council's assignment has been approved and carried. Operation Redeem All has been activated and set in motion. Jesus from across the table had a huge smile on his face, looked at Dutch and said, that's the way you do it. All who had joined us at the table except Jesus slid their chairs back, stood up to leave. They had a look of great excitement on their faces. They each patted Dutch on the shoulder as they walked off the deck, walking away until we couldn't see him any longer. The cloud of witnesses went back to heaven in the dream. And then Jesus said, Dutch, I remember it's not just me, it's us. It's what I represent in the dream. Hey, Dutch, hey, church, ecclesia, prayer movement, I'm with you. That's just one thing to read it in the Bible, but when you hear the Lord say it, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm staying with you to finish this. He then said, look at the map. When we looked, there was no tear in it any longer. And it was as if it had never been torn. Do you think it's possible that God could bring such a sweeping revival to America? Yes. 
that it would so transform our nation that it would heal this land from our sin, from our division, from our apostasy, from our death culture. How many of you really believe, really believe he can do that? I want to see your hand. He's going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to, before I read this next dream, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to abbreviate a 15-minute story into five minutes. I received in, well, this would have been 1990, I received a vision of the Lord showing me what he was going to do in, in America to heal this land and bring revival. I didn't know it would take this long. But after I received this vision, this was a profound vision. This was an open vision. This was a vision that you can't deny because it wasn't just a mental picture that with your eyes closed and you think you, this is from God, but you could be conjuring it up yourself. That's not what this was. This was when I was standing speaking to a group of people and with my eyes wide open, suddenly I couldn't see them anymore. I was seeing this picture and I couldn't get rid of it. And it was freaking me out because it never happened to me before because I couldn't see what was in front of me. I was seeing a panoramic vision. And the vision was a picture of the revival that was coming and it lasted for several minutes. I just had to stop and, and people just, they knew something, God was doing something and they just started praying. I went to D.C. a week after this to the National Day of Prayer. And when I arrived into Washington, D.C., a man came to me and said, Dutch, you know, there's a great, there's an interesting, awesome thing they do here this week and it's called a Bible thon. And, and they have a permit and they have a little canopy set up with a little PA system on the lawn of the Capitol and 24 hours a day, people come, take 15 minute slots and read the Bible to the Capitol. Prophetically, a statement that we're, we're declaring the word of God over America. And you sign up for your slot and you don't get to read whatever you want. They start in Genesis. The next person picks up where the last one stopped and reads for 15 minutes. So on till they get to the book of Revelation. Then whoever's next goes back to Genesis and they just keep reading the Bible through all week. And he said, I just thought you'd want to be a part of this. And I said, are you kidding? He said, the only slots they had left were in the middle of the night. You're on tomorrow night at 2 a.m. But I thought you'd want to do it, so I signed you up. I said, absolutely, thank you, I want to do it. As soon as he told me that, Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I'm going to confirm to you through the passage that you get to read that that vision was for me and that I'm going to do this. And I told the Lord immediately, I didn't tell anybody but him. I said, Lord, if I read my Bible for 15 minutes, it doesn't matter where I read. I don't care if it's the big ads. I can get revival out of it somehow. Even if it's the judgment of the wicked, I can get revival out of it. Anywhere. Give me 15 minutes reading the Bible, I'll get revival. So. The only way, this is not to put you to the test or make you do things a certain way, but I trust you. I just don't trust me. The only way that I would know that that is you confirming to me is that if because of what you've been saying to me in my prayer times and in my devotional time, the only way that I would know that I know that I know that it's a confirmation of, what you, of this vision is if I get to read either the book of Haggai or Habakkuk. Haggai is two chapters, Habakkuk is, Habakkuk is three. It's about five pages of this book. 
I said, I believe it was you anyway, Lord. So if that doesn't happen, I'm okay with it. But the only way I would know that the passage I read is a confirmation is if it's one of those two places. That's the only way. I, don't, I just wouldn't trust myself if it's any other, anything else. I showed up 30 minutes early as, as required, told the lady in charge I was there, started listening. They were nowhere near Haggai or Habakkuk. I told the Lord, don't worry about it. It's okay. I didn't want him to get hurt, hurt his feelings or <laughs> feel like he disappointed me or something, you know. Two minutes before my turn, the lady walked up to me and she said, Mr. Sheets, you're up in two minutes. I said, yeah, thank you. Then she looked at me and it was like she went into a trance. Her face just changed and it was like she was sleepwalking or something. She looked at me like she didn't know where she was or what she was saying. And she said, Mr. Sheets, you have your choice. You can either read Haggai or Habakkuk. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? <laughs> Nobody else got to read where they weren't supposed to. She looked at me again like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I felt sorry for her, really. She looked at me again and went, you have your choice. You can read either Haggai or Habakkuk. And I said, I looked at her like I was in a trance and I said, I'll take Habakkuk. <laughs> I've been holding on to that and other dreams and visions and promises God has given me for 25, 30 years, knowing in my heart we are inching our way toward the greatest revival in history. Now I'm seeing signs. Now I am not only discern it by the Spirit, I see things that let me know we're moving into this. I can look back now for three decades and see what Holy Spirit was doing to prepare, prepare us. Do you think it's fair to say that in the last 30 years, Holy Spirit has done more to us than through us? I don't mean two in a bad sense. I just mean he's been working internally in the church to prepare us for what he's about to do. And he now has things to a place where we're about to move into Operation Redeem All. Because this is gonna this is gonna hit the planet. This is not just an America thing. So there have been, I think, three other dreams that this person has had. I'll bring Greg up here in a few minutes to help me pray into this and bring Clay up, Clay Nash. But one of the other dreams that is connected to that one is the following. This was given to him in May last year. The dream opened with Dutch and I building a fishing platform next to a huge lake. We were told no one had fished this lake for years. As we built it, we talked about the fish we were gonna catch and how big they were gonna be. We were excited to be fishing. As we began to raise the platform, we placed it 
at 22 feet high above the lake. That's a little high to me for a fishing platform, but it's a dream, okay? You can do whatever you want in dreams, so. But 22 is my number. My life verse is Isaiah 22, 22. It'll give you the key of the house of David, put it on your shoulder, which symbolizes government or governmental authority, and you open doors no one can close, and closed doors no one can open. It's the anointing of Jesus, which he gave to us then in Matthew 16. Give you the keys to the kingdom. That's my number, 22. And the time I see 22 in a dream, I know God is reminding me of, of that, and, and it represents authority. 22 feet high, we thought, he says, as we climbed the steps to reach the top of the platform so we could fish, it seemed to be much higher than we built it. We, we just kept climbing. As we, as we reached the top, there was an angel standing on the platform awaiting us. He had tacked a sign there that read 222 feet. Some people, when they read this, they think that that symbolizes this year, 2022, 222. I don't know. I think maybe, but I'm confident that it's God saying that he's taking us to a higher level of authority now. That we've been operating at one level and now he's taking the church to a higher level of authority. We could see from here that the lake was shaped like the United States of America. We didn't know this before. You couldn't tell at ground level. Dutch turned to me, he said, in the dream, and said, I don't think we're going to get a fish today. The angel said, you're right. You're not going to fish today. You didn't climb to this height to fish, but to get an assignment. And here it is. Go to the Chattanooga airport. I was thinking about this when I landed today. Oh, here we are. I haven't been here since that dream. Go to the Chattanooga airport. There's a Radar Airlines plane waiting on you there. R-A-D-A-H. It's fascinating how the Lord talks to me in these dreams because, for example, he gives, he gives a word like this, and Greg or Clay, these guys get these dreams. They don't even know what the word means. I said, you know what that word means? Said, no, but it's what it wasn't a dream. It was Radar Airlines. I said, I know what it means because I have this love of word studies. So I know radah is the Hebrew word for dominion. In Genesis 21, 20, 28, uh, 26, 28, when God told Adam, I'm giving you dominion, radah, over the earth. So he showed up, he says, go to the Chattanooga airport to Rada, Dominion Airlines. You're going you're gonna to fly at a high level that pictures authority. Get on the plane. It will take you to Eagle Mountain Airport. When you get there, I'll be there, the angel said, and you get the rest of the assignment. The angels then slowly leaned into Dutch, almost touching his nose to Dutch's, 
and with a soft yet strong and forceful tone said, the Lord says to you, do not be late. This dream has messed with me ever since. <laughs> Keep telling the Lord, don't let me be late. I've got to hear from you. you got to show us what's next, how to pray, what are we supposed to do. We don't want to get behind. He says, do not be late. The flight is on schedule. Don't miss the flight. This is the flight of your life. We both felt the weight of his words. They were so heavy. As we stood there in shock from this encounter, he said to us, go! We're standing there looking at him. He said, go! Oh, okay. We turned and stepped from the platform. We stepped off of it at 22 feet, 222 feet in the air, and were instantly translated to the Chattanooga Airport. and found ourselves standing at gate 12. Well, some of you scholars out there, you know that that's a biblical number, and the number 12 represents kingdom authority, governmental authority. So we are 22 to 222, Dominion Airlines, gate 12. Doesn't get much better than that, does it? The gate was open. The lady at the gate said, hurry, get on. We've held the plane for you. We ran down the jetway, boarded, and sat down. As we did, we noticed we were in first class, sat in the bulkhead, row one. A gentleman from across the aisle spoke up and said, you boys headed to the mountain too, are you? It was Ron Phillips. Dutch said, hey, Ron, what are you doing on this flight? Why are you headed there? I love this. Ron said, I'm an apostolic veterinarian. <laughs> that was a new one for me. an apostolic veterinarian. An angel appeared to me in my home this morning as I was getting ready to go fishing with my son. Nobody getting to fish today. And told me to board this plane and go to Eagle Mountain. I had no idea you'd be on it as well. I just think it's so cool that we're here. I think... I think it's so cool that I get to share this dream here in Chattanooga with Ron Phillips. This is awesome. No sooner had he said this that we were landing on Eagle Mountain. We walked down the steps onto the tarmac and were met by the same angel we encountered at the 22. 222-foot-high fishing platform. Kenneth Copeland was with him. That's his ministry headquarters, Eagle Mountain. The angel nodded at Dutch. We knew in the dream that the nod meant listen to and help Kenneth Copeland. Yeah, think about what these people represent. I've already told you what I represent. Uh, what does Ron represent? He's an apostolic father, teacher, pastor gift, spirit-filled Baptist, represents a different stream, although working together, all of us. Kenneth Copeland represents a different stream, word of faith stream, but we're all working together in the dream. All of us, with Greg and I and Ron and Ken, all five ministry gifts of Ephesians 4 represented apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Plus angels. <laughs> Ken
Kenneth said to us, this is serious. We have to hurry. We climbed into an SUV with Copeland and drove away and drove way out into a very large field. Exiting the vehicle, we saw the strangest sight. This large field was filled with creatures that had the bodies of sheep and the heads of lions. There were thousands and thousands of them. And they were dying. Kenneth informed us that this was a rare breed of sheep that were bred so that at a certain age they would metamorphose into lions. He said to Dutch, they've been stuck in this form since November of last year. That would be November of 2020. I believe it's connected to the elections. I think a lot of disillusionment and hope deferred came to the church in the 2020 elections that stopped their growth in authority and kingdom authority. That's good enough. He said they should be lions by now. We're going to lose them all if we can't get them through this process. What do we do? Dutch said, we have to get them on their feet. Lions must be on their feet. Dutch then decreed, Lions, to your feet! I shouted across the field, Lions! To your feet! I didn't call them sheep. Called them lions. I didn't mean to wake some of you up, but <laughs> you can't read that quietly. I shouted, Lions! To your feet! That's what God's saying to the church right now. Get up, church! Get up, Ecclesia. Get up, prayer warriors. Get up. I'm going to need you for what I'm about to do. That's what he's saying. Get on your feet. You can stand if you want to, but I'm not trying to get you to stand, but hey, hallelujah for, for the lions in the room. That's what he's saying to us. I need you to stand up right now. I need you to act like what I made you to be. I need you to get all the despair, all the hope deferred, all the shock of the last year or two. It's been tough. Been unlike anything any of us have ever walked through. For some, it's been harder than others. For some, it's been devastating. But he's saying to us, I need you to shake it off and stand up. I need you now. Go ahead and sit. Immediately. Now, this is, I love this because once we begin to respond to the word of the Lord, in the dream, he immediately sends angels to help us. He's not expecting us to do this on our own. We have Holy Spirit. We have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We have his strength. We have his power. We have his gifts. And we have a host of angels that most of us forget about most of the time. 
And there are a whole lot more angels than there are demons. Only a third of them fell. And who knows, he may have made a few million, created a few billion more by now. But even if he didn't, there are a whole lot more angels than there are demons. Angels came immediately, assisting the sheep lions to their feet. When they were standing, Dutch decreed. This is what I said over them. Wind of God, blow upon these lions and bring them into the power of their true identity. I think that's one of the most poignant statements I've ever read in a book or a dream. Bring them in to the power of their true identity. As soon as Dutch decreed this, a wind began to blow. And the wool of the sheep was blown in a way that we could see under it. As this happened, we could see thousands of ticks attached to each sheep. The ticks were hindering them from transitioning into lions. Personally, I think it's a play on words. I think it's politics. I think it's a political spirit that wants to keep the church quiet. It wants to say, you know, you just be sheep. You don't get to be lions. You just go do your thing on Sunday morning and be quiet. You just love on one another and you leave everything else alone. You don't get a voice in government. You don't get a voice in education. You don't get a voice in media. You're just sheep. We're in control. That's what the political spirit is saying to the church right now. Thousands of ticks the ticks were hindering them from transitioning into lions. When we saw this, Ron Phillips spoke up and said, I have what we need in my doctor's bag because I'm an apostolic veterinarian. <laughs> That's awesome. He pulled out a horn filled with oil. He gave it to me, Greg, the man having the dream. As he did, I brought it to my lips and began to blow from it the oil that was in it. The wind came and caught the oil and blew it over the entire pride, covering all the lion sheep, killing and removing the tick. The anointing breaks the yoke, kills ticks too. Breaks that timid spirit off of us. And that that tries to push us down and keep us from moving in our true identity. I can't think of, if, if, if I were the devil, I don't think I could think of anything more terrifying than the church beginning to move in her true identity. As this happened, as the wind blew the oil over all of the lion sheep killing the ticks, 
the sheep's bodies began to turn into the bodies of lions. It was rather quick. During this time, Kenneth Copeland began singing over them. 2 Samuel 22, 30, verses 30 through 35, he began to sing. You want to know what that passage says? I know you do. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> For by you I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. By my God I can... I can run at a troop of warriors and leap over a wall. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is refined. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Who is God besides our Lord? Who's a rock except our God? He's my strong fortress. He sets the blameless on his way. He makes my feet like hind's feet or deer's feet. Sets me on high places, trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. And Copeland starts singing this song over all the sheep lions as they morph into lions. As he did, a deafening roar began to break forth from the lion. <laughs> it was so strong, we could literally feel the ground shake from the roar. We could now distinguish between lions and lionesses. Ron Phillips pulled a stethoscope, Apostle Veterinarian Phillips pulled a stethoscope from his apostolic veterinarian bag and walked out into the field. He placed it on the belly of one of the lionesses and shouted, this one is pregnant. He moved to the next, listened, then decreed, this one is pregnant as well. He did this through the entire field. As he said this, the lionesses would almost instantly give birth. They gave birth to sheep. What did you expect? They start as sheep. <laughs> but the sheep quickly began turning into lions. And the young lions began to roar also. And Copeland kept singing. <laughs> I can run the root troop, leap over a wall. And the more he sang, the more they roared. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just into this stuff. I know, yeah. I don't know. Some of you are just a little too calm right now. As this continued, the birthing of the sheep and then turning into lions, the lions began making their way to the tarmac where Kenneth had many planes waiting. They boarded the planes and he facilitated the distribution of these magnificent lions throughout the nation. I mean, doesn't take a lot of prophetic insight to interpret that, does it? That what God is doing now is preparing an army, maturing a company of people that he can send into the nation to accomplish his purposes, to reap this harvest that's coming, to set the captive free, heal the sick, break curses, They boarded the planes. He sent them around the country. As the planes were flying off, Kenneth approached us and said to Dutch, I'm so thankful you weren't late. We would have missed this flight. 
And we're called to release, we're called to release lions, not raise sheep. You know, maybe that's a part of the problem in the church. Maybe we let people remain sheep too long because a sheep are no threat to the enemy. Sheep are no threat to anybody. Only lions. At this point in the dream, and the, the, the angel walked up to Dutch and handed him a handful of papers. I could see on the top of the paper that it was a flight manifest. And the angel spoke and said, He's about to connect it with Operation Redeem All. Seal this manifest with your ring. This will activate mission, release the roar. We're going to activate tonight Operation Release the Roar. This is part of Father's promise of redeeming all. Dutch did as requested, and we watched the planes take the lions throughout the nation. You're born a sheep. But your DNA is to become a lion. I want to pray and activate us here tonight and decree from this place to the nation and nations. I want to invite Ron and Ronnie to come when I, as I begin to pray. I want Greg to come. I want Clay to come. We're going to begin to pray prophetically and prophesy over you, but I feel what the Lord wants more than that is for us to become an intercessory company for the nation. That we would stand in the gap for the body of Christ and break hope deferred, confusion, despair, weariness off of the church and activate Operation Release the Roar. You guys want to say anything before we pray? Greg, do you? Let me have, let me have somebody come up and play. <laughs> See, you're so prophetic, he's way ahead of me. <clears throat> come on, stand. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for our helper, Holy Spirit, our all-wise, all-knowing, omniscient, all-powerful helper who is carrying out the plans and instructions of the head of the church, Jesus, who is listening to you, Father, and the three of you working together, just as you always have, preparing us for this great outpouring of Holy Spirit that's coming to the earth. 
that will demonstrate power that we have never seen, that will move in a level of authority that goes from 22 to 222, that enables us to move across the nation in heavenly places on radar airlines, moving, operating from the headquarters of gate 12, kingdom authority. And you're not gonna let us get stuck in some place of discouragement or stunted growth. You're raising up an army. You said, Jesus, this would be a glorious church. You said you'd have one before you came back. You'd have a church the gates of hell could not prevail against. When they bind, it will be bound. When they loose, it will be loosed. I will give them the keys to my kingdom. And Lord, we are stepping into this era, this hour of your great, great, great outpouring. And here in this place tonight, we are going to prophesy to the church of America that you must stand up on your feet. Rise up out of all despair, slumber, confusion, complacency, timidity. You're going to get on your feet. The wind of God is going to blow on you. The oil of Holy Ghost is coming to kill every tick on you. You're going to rise up and be all that he has caused you to be. And your growth will no longer be stunted, Church of America. You were made for this hour, this season. You will respond. You will step up to the plate. You will be what he has called you to be. You will. Come on out here, guys. I want you to be close. I'm ready for you to jump in here in just a second. I don't care what order you go in. I just want somebody to start prophesying or praying. Lord, we just speak this now over this gathering and those watching. Stand up on your feet. Get everything off of you holding you back. The wind and oil of God is coming to you now to kill everything that's holding you back and move you toward your best and greatest destiny God created for you. Your best days are ahead of you. Dwayne, wherever you are, come on up here too. I didn't, call, I, didn't want, I didn't mention you, but I want you up here. Your best days are ahead of you, church. And Lord, we prophesy it over this house, but we speak it over everyone watching. And we speak it over those not watching us. We prophesy to the church of America and we say, get up on your feet. Shake off of you everything that the enemy has brought to try to hold you back. We blow the oil of Holy Ghost on you now. Come.